Hello, it's March. Does that mean it's getting warmer yet? I hope that wherever you are in the world, it's starting to get warmer. In Chicago, it doesn't really get warm until June, so I'm still over here shivering with snow everywhere. <laughs> but hi, I am Sarah. I'm the host of Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I am a psychotherapist in Chicago. I'm a group practice owner. I teach at a local university. I also host a podcast for the NARM Training Institute called Transforming Trauma. I do a whole bunch of shit. And I'm super happy that you're here joining us today for this amazing conversation. Before I tell you about our guest, I would love to invite you to become friends with me on Instagram. It is absolutely my favorite way to connect with people. And the handle is at Head Heart Therapy. And that's where we post memes and poignant stuff. I post a lot about anti-racism and learning about racial justice, that sort of stuff. So if that is your jam, come hang out with me on Instagram. A couple other ways you can connect with us is, let's see, Patreon. So if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a place where pretty much anybody can set up a Patreon account and ask for people who are into their work to give them money. And it's it's lovely. And I've actually made really good friendships with some of the folks who have been patrons at some point. So you can donate as little as a dollar a month and literally just a dollar a month warms my heart so much. And if you do sign up as a regular donor, I will send you a welcome gift. So you should get really excited about it. Okay, what else? What else? How else can we connect? We can connect on Facebook, which is also at Head Heart Therapy or at, com uh, wait, is it at, <laughs> at Wounded Healer? I can't even remember my own handle. And I think that's enough of a commercial today. So let me tell you about our guest, Bianca Hughes. Bianca is a lover of authenticity. She specializes in perfectionism, helping people embrace their imperfections and authentically be themselves. Bianca is a licensed professional counselor in Georgia, podcast host, speaker, and authenticity coach. And I am having the pleasure of being interviewed on her podcast as well, which is called the Authentic Wednesday Podcast. So you're going to get to hear her on mine, and then you can listen to me on hers, and we'll all be best friends. It'll be amazing. <laughs> all right. Enjoy my conversation with Bianca. Hello, Bianca. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> oh, yes. The microphone voice. That's so good. <laughs> Well, welcome. It's nice to meet you. This is the first time that we're ever chatting, and I'm I'm really excited to get to know you. Yeah, I am excited about this whole conversation. Although we've never met, I feel like it would just be so cool. So I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, you're cool. I'm cool. We're two. It's cool together. <laughs> and just so listeners know, Annie Schusler, who will have just been on a couple episodes before you, is the one who sent me your way, and I looked at your website, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> that was it. I looked for like two seconds and I was like, yep, I'm in. <laughs> so tell people, tell people about you. What, what is it that you do? Yeah. So my name is Bianca Hughes. I was born and raised in London to Caribbean parents. So my culture is English, probably more Caribbean English and a, add a bit of American because I've been here for 15 years. Mm. And I am a lover of authenticity. And everything I do, everything I am has been able to go into the work that I do. Everything I do is on purpose. It's mm -hmm. a calling. I enjoy doing it. It's not a drag. And I love being able to bring me into what I do. So the first thing I do is I am a therapist. Mm -hmm. While we're on here, wounded healers. I definitely believe being a therapist. And then there's also a healer. You know, there's so many different ways we can heal people and people can heal. And mm -hmm. I definitely consider myself, I feel like healers a bit more deeper in a way. I agree. And so I am a therapist. I specialize in perfectionism in Atlanta, Georgia, primarily with women, helping them embrace their imperfections and authentically be themselves. I also have a podcast, the Authentic Wednesday podcast, where me and my guests talk about what it means to take off our mask and be our authentic selves. So a lot of authentic stories there. And I was doing some coaching and I recently just decided I didn't like what I was doing. It wasn't mm. bringing me joy and I made a pivot. And so everyone's going like, well, all this different stuff. Have you planned it out? No, mm -hmm. but I know that I am called to speak with women 
particularly Christian women, um, because I am Christian, who have genital herpes. I came out and shared my story August of 2020. Yeah. And shared my story of having genital herpes. And I got such an amazing response. Even got a client, coaching client out of it randomly. And so as I was sitting down just a few weeks ago, maybe a week ago, I was like, this is what I really need to be doing. This is where my passion is. This is where I was getting more jewelry and it's where the need is. So, and I also do some speaking as well, you know, Mm. whenever needed. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that personal piece right up front. Have you ever watched the show Adam Ruins Everything? No. (laughs) It's really cute because he basically takes these things that we think are true, but it's, they're not always true. And what he does one on STDs and the one is like that genital herpes is like the worst one that you can get. And he's like, no, it like for most people, like they get it and then they don't have a breakout again. And there are just so many ways that it's been stigmatized to be the worst quote unquote, but it's not. It's not a death sentence. Oh my God, I need to listen to that. Yes, it is not a death sentence, but it's definitely the stigma that causes the shame and fear and anxiety and people are hiding. As I've delved more into it, I've learned that people are, you know, contemplated suicide. Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, then thank God you're talking about this. Seriously. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> I already like you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question out loud only because I don't want to forget, but I do want to go back and figure out like why you decided to become a therapist. But I was just literally talking with a friend this morning who she's American, but she's living outside of London right now and being trained there to become a therapist. Mm-hmm. And she asked me about essentially like bringing politics into therapy, not in order to obviously like change the way that a client believes, but essentially like social justice and anti-racism and that sort of stuff. And so she was, of course, she had a supervisor who's like, well, we have to be a blank slate, so we can't talk about this stuff. And so she was asking me like, is that what's going on back in the US or what happened? So I'm curious, since you have been completely immersed in both worlds, that you can answer that question. But first, (laughs) (laughs) okay, rewind. How and why did you become a therapist? I love this question because it's actually a second career for me. I know I look younger than I am. So I share because I don't care, but I'm in my 40s. So, me too. Yes. So it's a second career. I used to work in the travel industry. I love that for 10 years. That's actually what brought me to America. Oh, really? Mm-hmm, the job I used to be in. And I just was getting fed up and I really felt like I wanted to be in my calling, you know, kind of like what God called me to do. I just, I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives and travel wasn't doing it for me. So it took some volunteering, asking myself questions. What do I like, you know, out of all the jobs I've done? And, you know, the job... (laughs) helpful for this the <laughs> job that I discovered like what I really like doing like I knew I liked empowering and inspiring mm-hmm. encouraging people was from being a pole dance teacher that is cool as hell <laughs> so because there was an empowerment piece to it and helping people women feel empowered and you saw a lot of insecure women and things like that and I love that piece of it teaching I realized I love teaching didn't know That's what I loved. And of course, there's a teaching element in being a therapist. And so from that, just being in prayer and just searching and all these different things, it took about a year. I had a little bit of sessions, but they were more Christian advisement rather Mm -hmm. than actual therapy sessions, but just learning about myself and becoming more self-aware and having that experience for myself, I wanted it to be the same for other people. So in about 2012, yeah, about 2012, I decided... I didn't go back to like 2013. So mm. I never look back. No, like it was the most craziest thing. Every time I look back, I'm like, so who just stops their career and then just goes back to grad school for two years full time? Like, yeah, only me. I did. <laughs> I did. Too. Yeah. I was in my late 20s when I went back to school. But I yeah, for six years, I'd had a career before yeah. then that was in the arts and very similar. Like, yeah, this is fun. And sure, it's helping people laugh or whatever it is, but it's not doing what I want. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. And absolutely love it. Like, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious because you, you use a lot of Brene Brown language. So I was curious if you were 
a fan of hers or if that's just an accident? No, it's just an accident. I do like her work. Like I do share her work, but like I read her books and I've read her books and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I've been saying this and I've been talking to you this. So it just, mm-hmm. it just so happens. Like, yeah, I've read her work and I'm like, yeah, I say this all the time. Yeah. Cool. I was just curious. I'd love to go back to like the differences. And obviously you became a therapist in the U.S. just looking at the timeline, right? So you don't have the experience of being a therapist in the U.K., but I'm curious in terms of approaches, how would a British person like approach being in therapy versus a person from the U.S.? Like, do you have any sense of that? Just having yeah. grown up that way? I do, because obviously it's not talked about as much. I think someone said here, Someone else, someone said here, someone said in my family, like everybody in America has got a therapist. (laughs) So you can get a sense of how much is accepted. I had no clue about it growing up. No clue. Interesting. And I left there when I was 26. Mm -hmm. So imagine I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue about doing therapy personally. The most I knew about people like being, they call it, I don't know what they call it in your state, but 1013 is here when they point to the inpatient. So I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And so in England, you call it sectioned. Yeah. So I knew about people being sectioned. Mm -hmm. And that was like, of course, if it was super serious. Involuntary hospitalization. Let me just say that for folks who don't know. Yeah. So I knew about that, but that of course was serious, right? I knew people, I think I had had an ex-boyfriend that worked in like a hospital as well. And he would come and tell me about it. But it was never about for your personal like hmm. to make you a better person. It's changing now though. I do know another therapist, actually my mom's friend, she's a therapist and we exchange notes and we talk. Actually through Annie's course, I met another lady who's in England. So we talk and I learn stuff. And so I'm learning more about the therapy world there and how it's set up. But just as a society, it's changing now, but it's not like here as much. And then I guess I'm kind of like making up the next answer in my head because <laughs> right before I even ask the question, this is my problem. My brain <laughs> works too, it works too fast for my mouth to catch up. So just thinking about the how as a therapist we show up in the room with our social justice beliefs, with our desire for more like common good, right, instead of individualistic good, I can see that if the culture at large doesn't necessarily support therapy because there's some sort of fear, then it makes sense that we wouldn't want to talk about something difficult because then we might scare the few clients away that we do get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? It depends on the person. Of course. I'm a rebel, so I don't care. Yes. (laughs) Bring it. And I like to challenge people and I like to challenge the beliefs. And so I think it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I can see people being cautious, but I still think people are cautious here, Mm -hmm. especially in the South too. And yeah, you know what? I think that's a stereotype though. Okay. Okay. My my best friend is also a therapist in Atlanta and she moved from Chicago to Atlanta. So there are plenty of people who believe in social justice in Atlanta. Thank God Georgia turned blue, right? Like, (laughs) yes. But yeah, I've been listening to one podcast that talks a lot about politics and kind of the myths that we have. And it's like, oh, the South is more racist than the North. But it's like, no, like everywhere is racist. It's just the way that it's expressed is a little more obvious in the South, maybe. And that's Mm -hmm. it. That's the only difference. So so I guess when I think about a conservative client, that's not a fair judgment to say that it's different in the South necessarily. I can only speak about my experience in the South. Because I haven't lived anywhere else in America. You've only lived in Atlanta the whole time? Yeah. And all I can say is it does feel different in a way. And I do notice a difference when I go up north or when people come from, you know, from London. So I'm a city girl. So sometimes when they come from north, I have more in common just because of that north vibe. And it's a different way of thinking. I'm not saying there isn't any racism, but it's just a different. They kind of like this. <laughs> Like, yeah, it was, it's a faster pace. That's yeah. for sure. And London's like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I know that's the difference in the connection. And, you know, I was having a conversation with my mom, you know, recently with the capital. And I was like, I never thought I would ever think about getting a gun. And my mom's like, is it that bad? I'm like, yes, mom, it's that bad. Because she can't picture it because there's racism in England, of course. 
but it's more institutionalized. You know, English people are very subtle mm-hmm. with their stuff. So it's there, mm-hmm. but it's not to the level that it is here that you feel so unsafe that you feel like, oh my gosh, do I need to go get a gun to protect myself? Like I would never, I wouldn't think that in England. I wouldn't. And so I think that's the difference in a whole experience of the two kind of cultures for me. But there's still racism because Black people from the Caribbean or Africa didn't go to England till the 50s. So they haven't Mm. been there a long time. Because it was all about, you know, the English colonies and where England colonized, you know, England colonized the whole world. Like, (laughs) so, Mm -hmm. and then of course, where they were enslaved and brought to the Caribbean. So it's very new. Like I'm first generation in England. So Mm -hmm. different feel. Yeah. And you know, what you said that feels really impactful is the difference in the level of safety. And you're 100% right. And I want to understand, like, I want to dig into if it's okay because this is a very like this is a very serious and very sensitive topic and I don't even know you and I'm asking you literally all the deep dark secrets but if you would be able to kind of tease apart like really what is it that feels unsafe and your fears are valid right what is that though that's showing up for you that doesn't show up in England I mean the police don't carry guns they don't carry guns Mm -hmm. uh Oh, did anybody else know that? Because I did not know that. So why are our police carrying guns? Yeah, only special, like some areas of the police, they'll carry a gun. But regular everyday police, they don't carry guns. Mm, I can't speak because my head exploded. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) I mean, I'm literally speechless because it's like, okay, like, why haven't we looked at other models of Mm -hmm. policing? See, every time I learn something else, I'm like, I can't believe it. Okay. So that's the biggest thing. They don't carry guns. Only certain parts of the force will carry a gun. Like if you're in certain parts of London and and they're protecting the city or if they're on a special force and they might be undercover, they might have one, but you're every day. And then so also people don't really carry guns. If they got a gun, it's illegal. So there's more restriction. Yeah. Or you have like a special hunting license. And that is not easy to get. So, (laughs) Mm. and we know what happens when you try to take away a Southerner's gun. We certainly know about that, which is not cute. And I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking about the American colonialists coming over. Like, why was it important for them to have guns? Like, just because in the UK, King George said no. Like, what? Like, why was that? Why is it the Second Amendment? I don't even understand. Maybe that's why. Just because King George said no. Probably. I mean, that's what America is, right? <laughs> well, this is fascinating and has taken the turn that I did not expect it, but I love it. <laughs> You're still speechless. <laughs> I am because yeah. I have a family member who really loves guns and I just will never understand why it's important. And so it's really difficult for me to understand when we've had countless shootings that have killed mass amounts of people why we don't have different gun laws and it's it's just because king george said no like (laughs) if it's that simple like what is going on oh my god (laughs) but if you correct me if i'm wrong aren't there certain states where you can't have a gun i'm sure someone out there knows a lot more than i do about this there are places where you can't i think you can own a gun most places unless you're a felon but you can't necessarily carry it with you there's certain states that have what's called the conceal and carry license which in chicago we have that just a a regular old joe on the street could have a gun at any point in time but i believe that anybody can have them just in their house as long as you're not a felon i think but somebody google that for me and then let me know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, right. So what's your reaction to that as a, a person from the UK? Oh, yeah, I've never liked them. I mean, I've been to a gun range, but mm-hmm. I went to the gun range and I'm like, yeah, I definitely don't like this. Like, I I think one day I was in Walmart and I was telling my brother, I was like, you know, you could buy a gun with Walmart. He was like, no way. And so I was in and I sent him a picture and he was like, <gasps> So it's just fascinating to us. Like you can go into Walmart and buy a gun. I'm like, yes. And you can buy the bullets and everything. 
So it's just a whole different world, right? But that's like anywhere because I'm sure there's stuff people go over to every countries and like, this is amazing. I can't believe they do this or that in England. You know, and people are like, do you have a gun? You should get. And I'm like, no, it just, it's so interesting that if you're not brought up around it, how adverse you can be. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't understand why we need that. Because if you think I got here by the time I was 26, Mm -hmm. so it's not like I got here as a teenager and maybe my thoughts could have shifted. I don't know. My dad owned and loved guns and I was never into it. Okay. I mean, he focused more on my brother with the the masculine energy. (laughs) But yeah, he took me to a gun range and I was just like, I didn't like the feeling Mm -hmm. of shooting it. It was too much power. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. When you shoot it, I'm like, this thing is powerful. Mm -hmm. And when you put more power in the hands of people who don't know how to use it responsibly... And we have a lot of senseless death, which is what we're dealing with in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Lord almighty. Well, we started talking about your physical safety and ended up like on the second amendment, which is great. (laughs) (laughs) But that, I mean, that makes all the sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, I'm still kind of speechless. And I'm at this point right now in my career where I'm feeling a lot into the more macro things and like how do we create system change because that feels really important to me and I'm like I don't know I think we're stuck because some people love guns and some people hate them it would be a big change huge wow okay let's pivot because my brain cannot contain everything that's happening with that part of the conversation (laughs) and I need to do more research so how do you feel about the word healer love it Love it. Yeah. Because essentially, you're being trusted. You're holding space. You're using your wisdom, your care, your concern. And you're in the trenches with someone. And you are this vessel. Mm. And so I love the word. And I think it's a very privileged word or privileged profession. Like I always Mm -hmm. say, thank you for allowing me. Mm Mm-hmm into your space. Like it's an honor. It's a privilege, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know clients will never understand that. You know, I remember one of my therapists saying that to me and I was like, yeah, well, you say that to everybody. And that's true (laughs) because it is a privilege for everybody, but I didn't, I didn't really understand until I held in my hands, somebody's vulnerability, right? Somebody's parts of themselves that they've never shared with anybody else before. Like that is, it's sacred. That's the word that I have for it. Mm, very sacred I know what I was thinking no yeah sometimes I forget because we'd be having so much fun <laughs> right I too. right but it's why when you sit back though I think you know you're so in the mode like even sometimes I forget about that sacredness and being a healer because you can be so in the mode and you're going and you're then having fun and they're doing this work and then it's mm-hmm. tough and then you're frustrated and then you're questioning am I a good therapist Mm -hmm. and like you literally like have to sit back and be like wait a minute okay let's look at the big picture here and when you look at the big picture that's what you see right right clients also probably don't know how often we ask whether or not we're a good therapist (laughs) right like what is it once a week at least (laughs) yeah I don't know if you've ever seen this is it psychotherapy memes yeah Mm mm-hmm do you follow with that? the yellow couch? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> it's like the amount of times I've seen imposter syndrome on mm-hmm. her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you don't get any feedback. The most feedback you get is that they're continuing to come. Right. They might tell you every now and again. I learned about a feedback because I think a client posted me on their Instagram, and I got a client from it, mm-hmm. and so. That was how I knew. Right. Right. <laughs> that was that was how I knew. Oh, like I must be doing a good job. You post you shared who me on Instagram. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. You just don't know. There's not always this feedback in our field. Like you have to be secure in who you are as a therapist. Right. Well, and I think that the American culture of striving and success and all of that asks for us to have a linear outcome driven type approach (laughs) or that's what we expect to see is some sort of outcome. And I wonder that if 
you know, we were therapists in a culture that was more about like collective healing and intuitive wisdom. If we would want the feedback less, or if we would just be like, yeah, this is how it is. It's a roller coaster. I think we would want it less. I was just thinking and imagining I don't know what popped into my mind was Asia and just how calm they are and patient. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about also some of the African traditions, it's very patient. Like if you think about the Proverbs, like who says that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who who says all that? Mm -hmm. But it's just so full of wisdom and patience. It's not very patient here. Yeah. I would guess that that's probably similar for the UK too, because that's probably just a Western cultural ideal. Yes, for the most part. I mean, England's always been influenced by America too. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one of the th- reasons why I came here. I was like, oh yeah, I want to go to America. It's so great. Like, <laughs> And then you get here and you're like, okay, you guys just showed me the good stuff <laughs> on the TV. You tricked me. That's <laughs> hilarious. And I'm so sorry I tricked you. <laughs> that's really funny though. So, so is there anything in particular that you're like, I thought the streets were going to be paved with gold and it turns out they're dirt or whatever. Like, is there anything in particular that comes to mind? You know, this is the most random thing, but the banking system is way behind here. Like Mm. there are stuff that I was doing when I left London 15 years ago that just came out here. Goodness gracious. Well, I remember the little chips that are on credit cards now. I remember, God, it was probably 12 years ago that I had gone to France and I couldn't use the ATM anywhere because I didn't have that little thing on the card. Exactly. Chip and pin was out when I was leaving. Yeah. Yeah. We call it chip and pin. That was out. So that was, Mm -hmm. I was like, this is America. Like, Mm -hmm. why is this old? Like, you know, I thought this was you know, fast pace and um, only if it's profitable. (laughs) Yeah. And then the system, I don't know if this is Georgia, but like if you guys deal with anything to do with the government, it's super slow. Oh, that's everywhere. Okay. And it just, this just doesn't make sense. And there is an easier way, but it just seems like, okay, this is the way and you just got to do it this way. And I'm like, come on, fill out your forms in triplicate, get them (laughs) notarized. Why? Why? What? is the fucking point of a notary. (laughs) Somebody please write me and tell me what is the point of a notary. I've never understood that bullshit. (laughs) So, (laughs) I don't know. Right? (laughs) Yes. So, just small little things like that, that surprised me. And then, of course, coming here, like, you know, I've always traveled here, but actually living here is always different. And so you see more things like the segregation of different areas of where people live and this person's over here and that person's lived over here. And I'm like, uh, the Indian, the Jamaicans, the Mm -hmm. Brazilians, the Jewish and the Italians and the Turkish, we all lived on one street. Mm -hmm. And so that was profound to me. Like, do you mean I got to go all the way over here if I want this? And I got to go all the way over there if I want that? Mm-hmm. And are you ITP or OTP? <laughs> I am OTP. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, folks who don't know, that's outside the perimeter. I know the lingo because my best friend and my brother live there. Um, okay, so you're OTP. <laughs> <laughs> Which I still like geographically have no idea what that means. I just know it's a thing. <laughs> I'm just trying to show off now. <laughs> are you inside the 285 that goes around in a ring? Or are you outside the 285? Mm-hmm. That's the perimeter. The 285 is the one that goes all the way around Atlanta. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Atlanta traffic, forget it. I'm telling you. I never knew how bad it was until I went to Charlotte. My sister lives there. And uh, (laughs) it was a Sunday. And I said, Where's all the people? (laughs) (laughs) She's like, What are you talking about? It's Sunday. I'm like, So, have you seen a Sunday in Atlanta? (laughs) Mm-hmm. it's probably like one of the busiest days it's the new LA yeah but thankfully I don't like driving I don't like traffic so the office is 10 minutes from the house that's the way to roll I roll that way too yeah <laughs> I have a beautiful business partner he mm. is so generous and he lives further but he agreed no <laughs> oh, that's so yeah. great he was so sweet of him no oh. well back to the the healer talk and you said pretty much at the top of the show that you you believe all therapists are wounded healers. I'd love for you to expand on that. Yeah, we're human. Let's get this very clear. Therapists are human, healers are human. And therefore, we experience the same things as our clients. 
we have the same, <laughs> the same anxieties, the same pain, the same disappointments and traumas. And you'll find a lot of us tend to go because of our own stuff have brought us into this place and rats who've done the work or may not have done the work or are doing the work. And so that's why I really connect with the term wounded healer. Mm -hmm. Someone said once, you can only take your client as far as you have been yourself. Someone mm -hmm. said that once and I'll never forget that. And it's true. Every mm -hmm. time I do my own more personal work, the more I could go deeper with a client. Mm -hmm. There are times client comes in and I'm stuck and it's not because of them. It's because of me. And I'm like, I don't want to do this work. Like, mm -hmm. why are you bringing in my whole life story right now? I am not ready to deal with this. You are me and I don't like you right now. Right. And so you get stuck, but you know, you know the signs and you know how to do the work and stuff. So it's actually making me think randomly. I just had consultation today and someone, mm -hmm. and then they asked me that. And now I'm thinking, oh yeah, there is a client. I feel a bit stuck. Maybe now I'm thinking, oh, maybe I need to talk to my therapist about that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, side, see, side note, that's what we do. Right. I think that that's why it's such a value. And so when clients are coming in with this perfectionism and all this different stuff, and now I'm recognizing that perfectionism is a response to trauma and I'm dealing with my own trauma and I'm seeing it. And it's like <laughs> I'm emphatically, weirdly shaking my head. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, as I'm doing my own discoveries, clients are coming in with stuff and I'm like, okay, this seems a bit more. And then I'm doing my, and then, you know, it's not like I'm 10 million steps ahead of my client. I'm sorry. I like, I share, I'd be like, yeah, um, yeah. My therapist told me this the other day. So I'm going oh, to yeah. share this with you. I do the same. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not like we are this like, oh my God, you're just phenomenal and you know everything. I, told, I don't know everything, mm -hmm. but I'm not afraid to find out. I'm not afraid to do the work. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to admit my imperfections and I'm going to help you right along the way. And I'm going to figure it out. If I do consultation research, we need to bring in some extra. Or if I can't figure it out, we'll refer out. Yes. I'm not the therapist for everybody. Exactly. And so I just think that that's just, just wounded healer is just like, I'm human, just like you. And so many clients don't want that to be true. So many clients, at least that I've found, will come to me and it's a subtle thing, but they want me to fix them instead of recognizing that they're the ones that are doing the work. And sometimes it's obvious, right? Sometimes I'll have people be like, you're the only therapist who can help me. And then I'm like, then literally I won't work with you because that is the last thing you want to say to me because that's a setup. It's a setup for failure. I'm not going to do that. But oftentimes it's more subtle. In, you know, when a client is asking for advice, that's, I think, a way that it shows up because it's not my job to give you advice. It's our job to look at what all the options are. And yeah, I might have my opinion, but that's not therapy. Hmm. That's coaching. That's advice giving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing. <laughs> when people want advice and they want you to fix them. I had a situation like that recently and I said, nope. I said, you need to trust that gut. And they were like, I know you can't answer me, but can you? No. No. What did I say? <laughs> you need to trust your gut. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most important characteristics as a therapist to have boundaries, mm -hmm. to have really good boundaries. Mm -hmm. You can fall into, they said I can only help them, so I must be able to do it. And then you get mm -hmm. frustrated when it's not working. And so you really, I mean, I think that's a great boundary. Like, yeah, I'm not going to work with you because if you say that about me, then what happens if you're not healed? Right. Well, you're giving all your agency away. One of my staff members just took on a new client and that was kind of the theme of what was happening. And I try to train my staff on like the red flags, like when you're doing a consult call and somebody says a particular thing. And one of the red flags I tell them to look for is, you know, if this person says, I've been to a million therapists and nobody's helped me. What that tells me as a therapist is, is that person is not in touch with their agency or their agency is threatening to them and they aren't willing to do the work, right? And not that we won't work with that client, but just that the therapist knows going in, they're already being objectified and put on a pedestal. Mm. And so from day one with that client, 
it's always a constant reminder of, I am here to support you doing the work. I don't do the work. I don't give you the advice. It comes from the relationship. It comes from trying different things. It comes from healing our developmental traumas, right? It comes from so many different things. Being able to hold space Mm -hmm. comes in so important because we have Mm -hmm. to allow them to get in touch with those things like the traumas Mm -hmm. and connect to the pain and be with them in that moment. And I just want to let everyone know that's so difficult because there are times that you're like, oh my God, this person is about to just have a breakdown and I have to sit here. I mean, I'm present. And I'm with them and they know I'm with them. But you know when there's times when you just have to allow it to happen. It's painful. Because if you get in the middle, you're going to get in the way of their healing process. Mm -hmm. That's like one of our key characteristics of a therapist that you can get out of the way. Right. Yeah, I can literally think of three very specific times with three different therapists where I was going through a process that I couldn't put words around in the moment that it was happening. And if the therapist would have come in and interrupted my process because of their discomfort of not knowing what was going on, it would have ruined everything. And I wouldn't have had like, these were three like awakenings that I can speak to. And it would have never happened if the therapist couldn't handle their own discomfort. Mm. (laughs) Powerful. Yeah. What's coming up for you right now? I see you thinking. (laughs) <laughs> my therapist brain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm connecting to it. It's that like looking up into the right is like I'm connecting and feeling into. Being able to sit with your discomfort was the thing that caught my attention. Mm-hmm. Sitting in a room with silence because mm-hmm. where I'm like, I'm tired of talking. I'm not talking anymore. And mm-hmm. you just shut up mm-hmm. and you have to be okay. And I'm sure like then the client looks up and it's like, wait, she's not saying anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm not saying anything anymore. And that discomfort of like, when are they going to say something? Mm -hmm. But you know that you have to get used to that discomfort. Like it's Mm kind of where the healing takes place. 100%. Yeah. That's probably what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have to process that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the brilliance of these conversations is we're like, making it up in the moment of like, oh yeah, what do I, what do I really feel about this on a deep level? Yeah. That's how I had to think about that. Yeah. The discomfort is where the healing takes place. And I think that's what kind of happened, fortunately, unfortunately, throughout 2020 and why I know for me, a lot of my colleagues were so full because people were so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of discomfort, whereas before they were being distracted. Uh Uh-huh. It just blew up in 2020. Like there was no distraction. And you're like, oh my God, I got to deal with myself. Mm -hmm. And that discomfort was very prominent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of doing our own work, I'd like to like pull behind the curtain for lay people and let them know that anytime a therapist specializes in something, it's because they have it. So do you want to talk about your own relationship with perfectionism? Because I'm guessing that you're a recovering perfectionist, (laughs) like me as well. (laughs) Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always say I never wanted to work with people with perfectionism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was Talking like, I'm like, digging uh, into the wound. And pardon me, I just didn't want to be reminded. I don't want to go back there. I don't want to go back to that place. I'm not there anymore. I don't want to go there. Like, there is no there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you do not 100% cure from that perfectionism because it's a way of believing in behaviors. It's about belief and behavior. So it's not like they die down. You know, in some areas, they might not be there. But they can rear their ugly head when you get triggered, when you're overwhelmed, like when I'm in a new situation. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, well, I'm more aware of it. But yeah, and I just gone deeper. Like, you know, we're talking about the trauma piece and me discovering that. Yeah. Me discovering, really noticing just because of the spiral that you can get in perfectionism and people can't get out and stuff. And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, this is. And so because of that, I started to do some trauma consultation and someone suggested I do EMDR. And it just worked out. I really do think for me, it's like definitely a God thing. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I got an EMDR therapist because I'm like, well, let me try it out first. See, I try stuff out guys before everyone because. Oh yeah. I'm like, let me see what this EMDR is. And like about two weeks later, this opportunity came to get training in EMDR 
one and two for free. Yeah, it was for because of all the stuff that was going on with all the social justice, the racism, and there was not a lot of black EMDR therapists. Yes, right? because- reparations. It's expensive. Yes, amazing. And so we done that and included consultation. So someone paid for all of us. There was 30, I think about 28 of us. Wow. Yeah. And so that ended in December of last year. So now I'm an EMDR therapist. I'm actually working towards getting my actual, not actual, like I can do MDR, but you know, the full certification. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so working on the consultation hours to get that and whatever else I have to do to get the full certification. And so now I have this tool to help with a lot of the stuff, which is a lot of negative cognitions, which is a lot of the work that EMDR works through and through the brain Mm -hmm. and just where we get stuck. I love EMDR. I love getting it done and I love administering it. Someone was told me, well, it's more hands off, but I get to see this experience and changing people Mm -hmm. that is just to me very godlike and just very like I have no major part in this but I get to witness it right and again you know going back to that privilege and so I think that specializing in perfectionism because of my own stuff and I'm continuing to do the own work helps me a lot easier with the clients that I work with so gosh you just learn so much there's so much to learn about perfectionism it's funny though because like whenever I read I never i I never really read anything on perfectionism. I just use my clients and my own stuff. And I don't go and read it. And I'm like, see, this is why I don't read anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like everything, like I've already been saying and working through, like I don't have to read a ton of articles. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Well, now the entire listening audience is going, when is Sarah going to bring up NARM? It's now, guys. So I am obsessed with a modality, a trauma modality called NARM, Neuro Effective Relational Model. Okay, And I can't even express in words how much I love it because of exactly what you said, like being able to understand my own experience so much deeper than gives me a better foundation to support my clients. So I highly encourage you to check out NARM. I'll give you all the information. I'm obsessed and it's so great. And I'm secretly, nobody in NARM knows this, but I'm secretly trying to lobby for them to get a training in Atlanta because I think a lot of folks down there could utilize it. Is it to do with the brain? No. Okay. I think I'm fascinated. I I said if, you know, people ask me if I'm going to do, you know, when clients be calling me doctor, I'll be like, I'm not mm-hmm. a doctor. And don't say that because mm-hmm. that means that I might have to go back and be a doctor. And I don't want to say that. Right. I'm not ready to do that. But if I was to ever do a doctorate, I would do it in like neuroscience. Neuroscience. Something to do with the brain. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's fascinating. It's beyond fascinating. There's a new book. It's written by Lisa, Dr. Lisa Barrett. And basically she dispels a lot of myths of the things that we think are true about the brain, but they are not. And she really like breaks it down in super simple, like easy, understandable bites Mm. For those of us who can't necessarily, I'm pointing at myself, (laughs) who can't necessarily digest all the science information. Oh my gosh. Yes. What's the name of the book again? I don't remember, but it's Lisa Lisa Barrett. Lisa Barrett. Dr. Lisa Barrett is the neuroscientist who wrote it. Okay. Yeah. Learning about how, you know, the triune brain and where we get stuck. Triune brain is not real. That is, that is made up by white men because it was convenient for their narrative. No. Yes. I can't regurgitate the whole chapter. Oh, no. but, that, but it's, yeah. Wow. Sorry, I just blew everything you up. You did. Just blow my, you yep. just blew my bubble. I know, okay. right? I'm going to read this book. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to say, leave listeners with? You know, I like to say that whatever we needed to be said was said. I agree. You know, hope everyone, whatever you need to take from this, that you can take from that and we are not perfect. <laughs> we are human just like you. Yeah, but we just have a gift. That's what it is. Yeah. And do you want to tell people where to find you? So if you are looking to follow me about all things therapy, authentically be you on Instagram. Or should I say, you know what, just go to my website, biancakhughes.com. And then you can find all my social media on there. 
And then, of course, just, just search for the Authentic Wednesday podcast on all major podcast platforms where I talk about actually with guests, actually living in that authenticity and what it looks like moving from the perfectionism to that. So that's where you can find out more for me and connect with me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I appreciate you and I'm so glad we got to know each other. Yes. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. I'm so glad you invited me. So this has been a pleasure. Thank you to Bianca for being a wonderful guest today. If you'd like to learn more about Bianca, you can visit our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time. Bye-bye.